Hey guys, so I just want to let you know that after recording this uh, podcast episode, uh, the team at Dirac was gracious enough to offer our listeners 25% off the Direct Room Correction Suite, and yes, that includes both stereo and multi-channel. So, if that's something that you are interested in trying out, now is the time to do it. You can save 25% off. And all the details and information that you need to know are down below in the description box. And as always, enjoy the show. Welcome back to the RNR Audio Podcast. I am Ron uh, from NRD. We have Randy, Cheap Audio Man, and we have a treat for you guys. We have a special guest, which is Mat- Matthias Johansson. You got it fairly right there. <laughs> it's clo- close enough. <laughs> close enough. Thanks a um, lot. All the way from all the way from Switzerland. Um, oh, oh, come on, man! Uh, <laughs> this is Sweden. You you guys always in, Sweden, Switzerland thing. You're in Zurich, right? Oh come on! <laughs> all right, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Sweden, <laughs> Scandinavia. Oh yes, the center yeah. of the. Listen, it's, I love the Scandinavians. Absolutely. <laughs> It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. This is the first time that we've had a guest on the podcast. And um, here at the r r Audio Hour, we usually goof around a little bit. We relax. But we're going to try our best to stay on topic. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But um, No, I was very excited when this opportunity came up because I've always been very interested in Dirac. Dirac, how do you say it? Either way. Either way. Okay. Dirac. Well, Track is the way I pronounce Mateus it. Mateus is cool. We can just we, we can just call it. company. They all say it differently, so it's like I don't know what's right anymore. Yeah, yeah. But I was super excited because I've had some products that have had it built in, and uh, I was excited to talk to someone that's smart instead of Ron. Yeah, it's that and is true. I can't I can't blame you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Ron's very smart. Um. Well, why don't we open up the show by Matthias, if you can, just kind of give us an elevator speech of how Dirac got started and what, you know, how, what is your role in Dirac? And um, we'll kind of just, you know, funnel it from there. Yeah, we started Dirac. I'm, I'm one of the founders. We were six guys uh, at, uh, at the Swedish University, Uppsala University. And one of the professors, uh, Anders Alain, he's he was and he still is a huge audiophile. So he was would you know spend more money on his hi-fi system than on his house. <laughs> and he was starting to think, how can I use the, the the thing I do at work, DSP, digital signal processing, for audio to improve my hi-fi system at home. So he started a few master thesis projects, and that's where I came in, and and the rest of my buddies, so to speak. And we started investigating what can you do with speaker correction, room correction in the digital domain. So we started out with really crappy, cheap speakers, actually, and just goofed around with the algorithms we knew. And we realized you could do so much. So that was the start of the company. And ever since then, you know, we we tried to do sort of the we tried to provide the best value for any kind of sound system. Like, how can I get better sound? because that's what any sound system is about, sound quality. And we like to think that, you know, by using signal processing cleverly, that is the most value for money, that you can upgrade any sound system. So we're that kind of software upgrade to any kind of sound system, really. That was our vision then. It is today as well. And we we work in many different areas. I think most people know us from, from home theater receivers with room correction, with Direct Live. But we're also active in cars. Uh, we work a lot with, with different uh, premium car manufacturers, help them tune their audio systems, and mobile phones, recently headphones, and, um, and, and professional audio, and so on. So we're kind of everywhere where, where sound is relevant. We like to take sound to the next level, and that's what we're all about, so to speak. So when, you t- when you're talking about that, are we talking about, obviously, EQ, obviously, time delay and things like that but what are what am i missing i'm sure there's a lot more stuff stuff yeah, Very, yeah a lot more Definitely. Other I mean, things that you're looking at 
Definitely. And that's what we, we try to take sort of the most, we look at the sound system and, and treat, treat it as, we, we see the whole sound system as a signal processor, at, you know, and, and every component in the sound system uh, affects the signal somehow. And we just say, okay, how can we measure what's done to that system through these different components? And we measure it, characterize it, and then how can we optimize it to sound as good as possible? So EQ is sort of the, the, the you know, a crude version of what we do in the frequency domain. Um, and that's where it starts. You know, we, mm -hmm. our ears are sort of frequency analyzers to one extent, but that's not the only part, obviously, but that's a big part. So we always tune the frequency response of a system, which, you know, you could do reasonably well with an EQ, but then it's the resolution of the EQ is one thing. Are you actually really capturing and, and correcting each of the resonances you have in that speaker? Or are you in fact just making too crude adjustments? You're not really getting it right. And are you measurement based? Do you actually get it right uh, and not just adjusting for for like the song you're listening to, for example, which might have also been EQ'd in some way. Right. So yeah, it starts with the frequency response and sort of a high resolution measurement based EQ. But then it's a lot about, you mentioned time delays and gains in a home theater system, that's absolutely crucial to get the sound right. But we talk a lot about the time domain in general, also involving the, the speaker response, the face response, or what we call the impulse response, the impulse. which is when you, you know, insert a transient like this, and you measure with a, with a microphone the output of that, you get smeared out, this distinct pulse, it's smeared out. And music is all about transients, it's drum beats, you know, you stroke the guitar and so on. So it's a lot about the timing. And this is where I think we made truly a pioneering, uh, you know, breakthrough with Direct Live, where we really started understanding how you can do this impulse response correction and getting the time domain properties right of a speaker. And not just one speaker, because the time domain properties is what affects imaging and staging a lot. When you listen to a home theater system with, you know, let's say seven speakers around you, it could be a, an Atmos system with ceiling speakers, etc. Each of these speakers have slightly different impulse responses when they're placed in a room. And probably Can you, you don't explain on, for like um, a layman? Explain impulse response just real quick. Yeah. So that's what you measure at the, you know, at your ears or wherever you want to measure uh, when you insert a very short, uh, like a clap of your hands, like that, or a gunshot. That's an impulse. You send it through the speaker, and then you measure the output. It's no longer an accurate uh, you know, copy of this impulse that we sent in. It gets smeared out. Because think about a speaker. Essentially, if you say a, a one driver, single driver speaker, if you insert something like that, if you look at the electrical signal that goes to the speaker, it's like zero everywhere, and then there's a voltage, and then it's zero again. So ideally, the driver should just move out for a split second, and we talk about split millisecond really, and then back in and stay there. But this is a mechanical system, it's, it's a spring. So it's, of course, going to keep wiggling a bit after going down to where it should be at rest. And that's where we control it with our impulse response correction. So it becomes critically damped and doesn't you know, keep vibrating after that gunshot or drum beat. So you get a more distinct sound. That's the impulse response and impulse response correction. Uh, so it's, it's a tricky term in a way because it's easier to understand the frequency domain with different frequencies and so on. But it's pretty fundamental because, you know, you get reflections also from surfaces and so on. These also show up in your impulse response. So when you look at the impulse response, you're looking at everything that goes on in the time domain. You're seeing all the reflections. You're seeing the behavior of each of these drivers in your speaker. And when you're also 
having more than one speaker, first of all, stereo, and then say a surround speaker setup. What's really important is how the imaging is affected by these differences in those different impulse responses. Because when you think about, let's go back to stereo. The whole principle behind stereo sound is that it's funny, right? You, 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 you get the whole panorama between the left and the right speaker. You can hear the voice, the phantom voice, very distinctly in the center if you have a well-tuned system and right. everything you know, from outmost left to the right. But when these reflections, and, and that's the whole principle behind stereo. So we hear that phantom center in the middle, even though it's really two speakers are playing. We don't hear these two individual speakers if we, if we play back the same signal in the left and the right speakers. But what happens when you play it through a real speaker setup and room that is slightly asymmetrical is that the stereo properties are worsened. They're no longer as intended on the recording. So when they reach my ears, that signal that was supposed to be a mono signal, really like a phantom center, it becomes distorted and becomes slightly smeared out. So okay. you cannot hear distinctly where it's coming from. This is often a difference in the impulse responses between the left and right speaker. And then you elevate that problem when you have a home theater system. The more speakers, the greater the problem becomes. And you might very well end up hearing, you know, individual speakers instead of hearing the sound field you're supposed to hear. So when you do this impulse response correction, and you even out those differences in the impulse responses, then you get a much more accurate stereo or surround image. So that's pretty important because when we listen, you know, that's that's so fun with sound, right? It's it's so multidimensional. You don't just hear the yeah. frequencies, you hear the location of the instruments and the distinctness of that location and you know all these other things, right? But when you get the imaging right, which you do with impulse response correction, the whole sound comes alive in a very different way than when you don't have them properly aligned. So that's why both the time delay alignment and these impulse response corrections are really important to get sort of at that top end of you know what your system can really reproduce to get the full potential out of it. So what is, give me one of your favorite songs. Yeah, Just that favorite would, song. Oh, that would be, what should we say? <laughs> your favorite band, one of your favorite bands. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the the who i would say okay all right ron likes the who. i knew so, i knew yeah. i liked this guy right off the bat right. i knew all it. right baba o'reilly okay you're oh, yeah. listening to baba o'reilly and you've got a system it's a decent system you got a system and you turn it on and you might not have a perfect room you hear it now you turn on Dirac, and you, you've, you've had it you you've dialed it in everything's good what are we hearing differently when we're running Baba O'Reilly with a direct and we aren't hearing before specifically. And I, and I can kind of tell, is it just more resolute? Are we hearing more of the song as yeah. a, from a practical perspective, Baba O'Reilly go. <laughs> You're going to hear that. It's him. That is not Elvis Presley or somebody else. That's the first thing, right? Because you get yeah, high, like getting high. He risk. sounds like Elvis when he comes out of my speakers. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> because you, yeah, maybe you tuned it incorrectly. Uh, <laughs> Probably. I don't know what I'm doing over here. <laughs> but, and you'll hear more distinctly. Like, where is it? Because sometimes, depending on your room, it can be quite hard to, to hear the voice and separate it from the other instruments and where exactly is it located. And what I like personally is where you really can sort of reach out and touch that person. It's like he's yeah. there, exactly there. It makes such a big difference to me but then of course what you really get in any i would say in any kind of decent room correction system is just the base because you get a lot of base build up in rooms these room modes just coming from the geometry of of your uh of your listening room of course that's the you know getting that right so that the all of a sudden you don't get that chesty sound that you really get accurate voice and also the, the overall the, the bass fidelity with the bass drums and everything. 
that gets much better. But then when you come to the higher end, like the treble, there, to be honest, it's also a lot about the speaker itself. Mm. Even though we're doing room correction with Dirac Live, we're measuring the whole system. So if you have an issue in the treble with your speaker, because it's not unusual to have various kinds of resonances in the speakers themselves that are hard to fix hardware-wise, we'll take care of that as well. And what I would say normally happens is it becomes, I should say, less harsh. Maybe that's a typical thing. But I would say another typical reaction is that everything falls into place somehow, gets more relaxing and, and clearer. That was a long answer to your question, but it's no, you know, I like it. You know how hard it is to describe what you actually hear. In the end, you have to hear. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I do it every day trying to describe what I'm hearing. It's not easy. It's yeah. like telling someone how a rose smells. Good luck. You know, I had a good quote once from, uh, from uh, the early days when Dataset started using and trialing Direct Live in cinemas. And they were watching at one of it was one of the, these big theaters in Los Angeles. I can't recall which one. Anyway, it was a huge system, obviously, lots of speakers. And and I remember Carl Huff, I think it was from from Data said it's like you know we were watching uh, what's it called um, Patient Fifty Seven or something. It's it's a uh, it's a book that was filmed. And in the beginning, there uh, there's a small boat in a big ocean. And he was like. When we turn on direct live, we realize the ocean is a big place. Mm. You know, that's the kind of thing that you, you really get that gets through. All of a sudden, all the stuff gets through the speakers. You're not listening to the speakers. You're listening to the actual content. When we've done it right, that's what you get, I would say. Interesting. Yeah, it, you know, one of the things that um, you said that resonated with my own experience of using Dirac is, and so many of our viewers, you know, bass is, is a, very challenging, you know, especially in smaller rooms. And I think one of the more common um, questions that we get is how do we, how do we tackle bass? How do we clean up bass? And um, I, I'm, I'm an audiophile, right? I consider myself an audiophile and I have a listening room and I've gone through um, you know, all the necessary steps that one can take by getting acoustic treatment and getting stuff on the walls and doing all of this hard work to clean up, you know, the sound. And one of the light bulb moments for me when I remember, and I remember it, when you, when that happened, he, so Ron and I are friends. I don't know why, but we are. He literally listens to it. He calls me up and he's like, I cannot believe what's going on. All right, so now go, Ron. Yeah, what it is, is it dawned on me that perhaps not in every single situation, but I would dare say in most environments and most situations, this lends itself to being free of having to go down the road that I went down, where maybe you're, you know, you have to take your spouse into consideration, the living environment that you're in, like, you're going to put what up on my walls? Like, no way. And it dawned on me, I've spent thousands of dollars on room treatment. And if I had direct from the get-go, I don't know if I would have gone down the same road. It's like, it really is incredible how you can just clean up yep. the room. And you're not putting anything on the walls. It's like, wow. So um, I wanted to mention that as you were talking, I was like, I'm totally picking up what you're putting down, and I totally agree with you. Um, and, you know, we're not here to market Dirac. I mean, that's not what this is about. I'm just telling you, based on my experience, that is exactly what my experience was. As I'm looking around and I'm thinking, this is an easy recommendation for so many of these guys that can't do acoustic treatment. It's like, this will get you very far. And I should note that some of the frequencies that we're talking about and you probably know this, the amount of treatment that you would need to really effectively use to, to deal with 30 hertz, 40 hertz, 50 hertz, it's mind-numbing yeah, how much treatment that is. And Dirac, clean. I mean, that's, that's an important point that, you know, room treatment for the bass 
are the hardest ones because they're they're yeah. space consuming. You need huge yeah. base traps. You and need stuff. mass. Yeah. So it's like for the higher frequency, it's actually much easier to do some active trade. You just have some diffusers and stuff that can look nice. It doesn't take up a lot of space, but base that's that's heavy stuff. <laughs> it's big wa wavelengths involved, and 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 that brings home an important point. I think that you know in the end what we're listening to is the sum of the analog design and the digital design and and i always stress this that it's not one or the other you need both and you should use them cleverly so digital signal processing is a great way to tackle the base but if you don't have <laughs> a speaker that can produce any base in the first place well tough luck you know with dsp yeah. we can maybe extend the base a little bit with some tricks but we can't in the end we need to move air so we we are always sort of working within the boundaries of physics we're trying to stretch them as far as we possibly can but certain things you need to design right of course in in the speakers and so on but certain things like bass control is very effective to deal with in the digital domain it's much easier it's much cheaper and less space consuming Whoa, I like that other one. I was like half of my face was cut off, Ron. Can you yeah. hear that again? There we there go. go. Hold on. Right there. That's perfect. That is perfect. It looks great. <laughs> I like what you're doing over there. So this is all great. And everyone listening right now is like, awesome. I want to try Dirac. Yeah. What pro and I, I'm familiar with some pro like the NAD, NAD yeah. M series. They they integrate Dirac. Um what if someone already has a system? And so two part question. One, someone has a DAC that they're absolutely in love with. They love this DAC. And I have struggled with this in my own brain because, and I haven't looked at a standalone Dirac, but I've got this DAC that I love. It does everything I want it to do. Am I taking that out? So I'm taking a digital signal from my computer or CD player. I'm bringing it through my DAC. Now I'm plugging it into the system via analog. And now I'm reprocessing it from a digital perspective, again, am I going to lose the flavor of my DAC? Hmm. Well, that, that's actually, I mean, that's a very relevant question. I would say normally no. It okay. might be if, if within, if you're actually doing it that way, you're going from, you know, first a DA conversion and then into an analog input to, to some unit going over to digital again. You know, you're, you're risking doing that. Uh, so one of the ways you could do it, obviously, is you might want to put all the processing in advance then while, while you're still in the digital domain. You have oh, your back. Okay. You know, you could, if, depending on what your source is, you could even use, when it comes to Dirac, we have this Dirac Live uh, room correction suite where you can do all of this stuff on your PC. So if, you're, if your mm. computer is your source, then we can do the processing in the computer. Um, so, you know, every time you, of course, uh, do a DA conversion, if it's done right, a good DA, ADDA, shouldn't affect the sound. That's the whole point, essentially. You don't want it to flavor the sound, I would say. It should be yeah. transparent. But obviously, it depends on the design of each of those components. It's hard to make them all sound perfect. So there's, of course, that risk if you do multiple conversions back and forth. That you actually lose some something along the lines. I got you because for me, I I'm into I like ladder decks, you know R two R decks, and I like the fact that there's a little bit of flavor added, you know, with mm -hmm. second order harmonics and things like that. It to me that 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 opens up the space even more. So that was always a concern of mine. Okay, so I'm taking an analog signal, I'm converting it through to digital, back to analog, and then back to digital. But doing an upstream of that, you know. That's that's very interesting. The yeah. the second question is if my audience for the most part, you know, we talk about products that, you know, usually sub $1000. So, is there standalone boxes that one can get that they'd be able to take advantage of Dirac? Yeah, you know, very uh w w one option which is very interesting I'd say is these units that come from Mini DSP. They have um, the okay. range of different products which are essentially processors they have you know 
stuff with amplifiers, without amplifiers, uh, digital in, digital out, so you don't need to lose anything of that. Uh, that's actually a pretty good uh, uh, setup for, especially for a stereo setup. They have some really good options there. I can't remember the exact pricing at the top of my head. That's one option, but now just actually, you know, it's been out for a while, but today I saw a press release also that Onkyo is coming out as well as Pioneer, Pioneer Elite and Integra with some receivers that are really mm. good value for money uh, with Direct Live now. Awesome. So that's awesome. actually, that's, that's pretty big news, I'd say, that, that brings yeah. it home, brings it, you know, to a much, you know, to a very, very nice price point. So that's yeah. pretty yeah. exciting, I'd say. Oh, I know Emotiva also uses Dirac. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Exactly. Yes. So the most simple, I guess, one one of the questions that I have is: it sounds like the most simple way um, that somebody that's watching this that they could use Dirac is they would simply just and correct me if I'm wrong. They just need a computer and Dirac Live, and then I would assume some type of a US probably USB microphone for the. Yep. That's exactly. it, and you're you're good to go. You can do it. That's that wow. is the easiest way, and and then you're you, you know you you can do whatever hardware choices that you like. So That's we have cool. that on the the website direct.com. You find it there, and it's possible to trial it for 14 days. You'd have to buy a microphone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Media DSP, for example, provides a USB microphone, real cheap. So we'll see. You know, you can just try it and and see if you like it. Most people tend to. And then, uh, and then you're off, you know, and then you don't need any dedicated hardware for the processing. Um, another question I had is, you know, we've been talking about Dirac in the context of, uh, you know, you have two speakers, home theater type situation. Um, why don't we transition and kind of pivot to how does that work with subwoofers and base management? How do you guys tackle that? And is it different from how you're handling, you know, time domain information, you know, within, you know, s s just a pair of speakers. Yeah. So with subwoofers, I mean, the way we do the room correction in general is, you know, at some point we treat each channel independently and look at like what what are they doing to this room, and we're cleaning that up. But then you need to look at the sum, of course, of the different speakers. So say you have a two point one, you know how. How does the base sum up and the crossover region? So we have actually a few different options. Uh, one is really the, the easiest one is just to set crossovers uh, between the mains and the sum, and then you know we're taking care of just aligning those together. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have what we call the uh, not base management, but we call it base control mm -hmm. functionality, direct line base control, and that is especially useful when you have more than one subwoofer but let's yeah you know it, it first of all it aligns the subwoofer with the mains and it optimizes the crossover region as well mm. with all pass mm. so that they really sum up perfectly because if you just look at one speaker at a time you're not controlling the sum response so there we're making sure to align them perfectly and what we're also doing, which is kind of unique, I think, is if you have multiple subwoofers. Because multiple subwoofers is a great idea uh, to even out the variations that you have in a room, especially if yeah. you're like having a pretty big listening area and you're many people listening. Uh, it can be pretty annoying. It can be big bass buildups in one seat and another seat you have a big dip in that even. Yeah. So it can be like 10, 20 dBs of differences. The whole idea of having more than one subwoofer is to even out those differences. The problem is how do you, you know, position them and tune them so that that you actually get that and that you get to your overall target response. That's yeah. really hard to do manually. It is. It is. Yeah. So this is where this uh, base control uh, functionality comes in. Really powerful because it make sure that these subwoofers and the mains play in perfect harmony. Again, you know, measurement based, so we know what the different subwoofers actually do in the room. And what we do is we're evening out the variations between the seats, but we're also making sure that they play optimally together 
so that you get an even better impulse response and base response. And you know that's that's pretty powerful. So that's our advanced version of base management, which we there therefore call base control because it really controls the subwoofers together to make uh, for for a much better uh, sound experience. Mm. Tell me but about your just standard uh, base management filters as well, um, and then you can see the sound responses and so on just in in the basic direct live. Tell me about your system. What do you have? What do you listen to personally? Actually, my my best sound system right now, the one that I prefer the most, is my car sound system. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I got a uh, I got a Volvo with a Bowers and Wilkins sound system, which is uh, you know tuned by us using what we call the Dirac Unison technology, which is an even more advanced room correction solution actually. Eventually, it's going to reach the consumer audience as well. Uh, so that's actually my preferred system right now because the bass response there is unbelievable. Uh, and also, that's where I spend time and have time to listen these days. Right, right. You know how this with family and so on. So I used to have, I'm actually transitioning right now at home. I used to have um, a system with, with some Lin speakers, stereo setup. I've never really been a home theater um, guy myself. Uh, I've been stereo, sort of classical, <laughs> you know, hi-fi, and then the Rotel amplifier. But I've switched that out, and right now, because you know, we, we we talked earlier about you know you have to take on, into consideration the rest of your family, um, and then the space issue in your living room and so on. And there were some complaints at home, so for yeah. the time being, uh, I'm sort of without a, a good uh, setup at home. But I'm now looking at with some of the new uh, processors coming out with Dirac and looking to uh, acquire some new speakers. So, you know, uh, looking at uh, the next, uh, yeah, to level up my home audio system. I don't know what you guys would recommend for me. Oh, we, you don't want to know. You'll, you'll be broke <laughs> in a quick hurry. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the issue. That, that truly is the issue with, the, the, with my work, you know, I'm I'm constantly listening to sort of the best sound systems yeah. on the planet, and you get yeah. spoiled with that. And it's like, you know, the, the budget just keeps increasing for what what uh, you really yeah. want to have at home. But I'm looking at when when we release some future stuff also with this multi bass control and so on. That uh, by using multiple subwoofers and uh, and satellite speakers, I think can. You're gonna come up with a with a system that sounds like a huge system in terms of you know the overall dynamic range and, and bass response that I want, but still satisfies the requirements for my dear wife as well. Sure. So. <laughs> no, I get it. You can't have like Ron, he has like two obelisks just hanging out in the middle of his <laughs> listening room. And <laughs> If that was me, I would be getting up in the middle of the night, knocking things over, stepping on Legos, and it it, it wouldn't work. It it would last for about three hours before I completely destroyed <laughs> it. So I get, I understand. I've got young kids and everything, and I, you know the speakers are where the speakers are at. I, I'm yep. just trying to keep the kids from poking out the drivers. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So barbed wire, you, barbed wire works. Yeah, we just we don't little razor that. wire around the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Looks nice. They'll too. get it. They'll get into it, but it'll only be once. <laughs> one time, and they're yeah. done. Um, from a usability standpoint, one thing I wanted to kind of highlight was, um, you know, just the fact that using Dirac is is a bit of a joy in that, you know, you can do it on your phone, you can do it on a tablet, you can do it on the on a computer. And that was, again, a bit of a light bulb moment for me. So I wanted to kind of highlight, like, the process, like what what you do. And I remember that when you go through Dirac, there's different seating positions. And so if you don't mind, just give us an idea of, like, you know, you grab your phone, you start the app or whatever. What does that process look like? So when you, when you fire up the app, it's going on your network and looking for units that are Dirac ready so to speak that 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 are uh, able to support direct so it will just find find the unit for you and let's say you have an arkham or an ad or something it will show up there in the app is this the unit and you say yes sure is and of course you you connect your microphone either to your pc or uh, to the unit 
like NAD, they they have a microphone connection to the actual to the to the unit itself. So you just connect the the microphone, and then it's gonna do like checking your levels that it's okay for you. Nothing more fancy than that. And of course, like you said, then your seating arrangement, because what we want to do is a room correction for your place, and it, and you want to measure. Essentially, what you want to do is just measure uh, with the microphone at the positions where you're going to be likely to be seated when you listen to sound in this setup. And and just to guide you there, there are different seating arrangements because then the software shows you position the microphone here and then there, and you have like this 3D image. So it's really easy to see where to position the microphones. Because one of the things is we take several measurements, not just one measurement. Because one measurement right. will not tell you enough. Simply, uh, room acoustics is such that the, the sound, the sound response, the, 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 the sound changes from one position to the other. So we want to get a sampling of the space where you're listening in. And and that's sort of is the step you go through. That takes time. You do your measurements. It doesn't take so long, I guess. But it's still you take the measurements. You Make sure you're out of the way of the speakers so that you really hear, so that the microphone captures, you know, the speakers and no obstacles. And you try to, you know, keep all the noise and so on down. The software will tell you if there's a, an issue, though. I mean, if, okay, it's mm -hmm. too noisy or it doesn't right. hear the sound, it'll tell you, oh, you know, you need to check your, you know, your fan or something. So then you come into what many people find fun which is you've taken all your measurements and then you see the frequency response and the impulse response of your system and you get sort of black on uh, black and white what your system actually does in that room and that's always interesting and uh and, and then you see it and then you have a suggested target response and then you can just you know go optimize and then you get filtered and you can listen to it finally but yeah. Uh, you can also go in and tweak the target response. And when mm -hmm. we talk about the target response, it's the frequency response that you want at your listening position. So, and this is actually, you know, we provide a default target that's based on on how, if you're listening to relatively high levels, relatively loud levels, if you're listening to very low levels normally, actually what you want to do is boost the bass a bit and why loudness, it's a loudness button yeah like the old is. receivers yeah. loudness button i love I mean, loudness button i actually love loudness and the reason is our hearing is what do you say non-linear so when you listen to to low levels in order for the bass to sound you know equally loud as the treble you actually need to boost the bass yep so it's it's somehow it's not so easy to set one target response because it depends on the listening level that you're going to produce. So we have set it where, you know, we think most of our customers are listening, relatively big system, relatively loud. If you're listening to lower levels, and this is just, you know, you can easily just export another setting and listen to it for yourself. You can boost the bass a bit. It's, it's just draw, you have a curve and you can just adjust it graphically. Mm -hmm. Your mouse is really easy, and it's a bit fun as well to listen. It is and hear how the sound differs, and this is where you come into the sort of subjective part, because sound is subjective. In the end, it's it's the experience that counts. And what Amen. we say, we clean up the sound, and then we allow you to adjust the target to your preference. Which is, yeah. you know, I might simply prefer to have more bass, or I, you know, I bought the speaker with a certain characteristic that I really like in the mids. Then I just follow the original curve there, mm. for example, that I measured. I don't need to go with sort of a neutral flat response if I don't, if I don't like. This is in the end where sort of the artistic, fun, subjective part comes in. And we we say, you know, we provide the tools. We give you a standard curve that's going to sound great. It's going to sound very transparent. It's going to be clear. But if you like, you can adjust it to your liking. Because you know, it also depends on a little bit on on the speaker you have, sure. and and the music you listen to as well. Sure, sure. So that's essentially the steps. It's like, what system am I using? Check the levels. Mm -hmm. uh, select seating arrangement. 
follow the on-screen instructions where you should position the microphone and 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 then uh, adjust the target curve if you like or just go with a standard to begin with and then enjoy the results and switch on and off because that's that's the thing right to hear the yeah. difference and you will hear how how much the room actually does to your sound normally yeah so is your target response what db listening level is would that equate for your target yeah it, it's i can't say exactly on top of my head but it's it's a loud level it's like 9500 dbs or something like that so if you're going to listen to more like 885 you probably want to crank up the bass a bit okay you perfect know, around, and normally what i would say is where you want to make these tweaks normally where it makes the most impact you know around 80 hertz okay. to read below 100. you know two things that i wanted to highlight um now that we're talking about it is um I, I loved messing around with the curves. I had a lot of fun doing that. And I actually found um, is that I, it started training me as to where things actually sit in the mix. And right. it made me realize that a lot of things that I thought were way up higher are not. They're actually lower than what I thought. Um, and then also another cool thing is um, like in, in my examples, in my room, in my listening, based on my taste, um, I loved everything that Dirac did up to a certain point. And the cool thing about Dirac is, let's just say that you're you're happy with your top end extension and you don't need Dirac to correct anything. You can set up a curtain. So if this is, you know, the entire bandwidth, you can back it down to up to 200 hertz or 300 or 400 yep. or whatever you want. And then you can say, Dirac, don't mess with anything on top. Leave it alone. And um, I thought that was just so powerful. I'm like, wow, I love what it's doing with cleaning up the base. I love that it's managing or controlling a lot of the base issues that I have. And it leaves the top end alone. And I was just so happy with that. With that. I'm glad you like that. I mean, that's what we realized that, you know, in some cases, you don't want to really change the sound you have beyond a certain frequency. And I think, you know, it's, it's everybody typically agrees that the base response you want to because that's just yeah. the room but then you choose in your speakers and you really like how they sound at a few kilohertz or you know and then we said you know then we make it an option we don't do anything above there we just make sure we clean up the base and let the rest be uh, as it is so again it's more like we provide this flexibility so you can do what you feel is is the best in the end yeah going back to one of the things so you mentioned um, mini DSP. So that utilizes DRAC or? Yeah. So you have a range of mini DSP products that are, they're called something with DL. Okay. So anything with DL is. Yeah. Is then they have direct. They have, if you go to their website, there's like this product uh, page on the menu. Then you're going to see a DRAC live series. With a number of project uh, products from you know ranging from two by two, two four, and up to you know surround uh, processes as well. So oh, I got a is. flexible range of uh, products. Yeah, Dirac series right there. Exactly. How how does licensing work with Dirac? Like, are you are you licensed with a lot of different companies, and is that growing? Is that expanding? Are we going to see it on more products? I sure hope so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Please. Yeah, we're, we're trying to license it to anybody who wants it. Essentially, right? We want okay. to spread, spread, spread the, the this uh, better sound to everyone. So, yeah, we're we're licensing, and that's sort of what we do primarily. We we license our technology. So, with when it comes to Direct Live, we have quite a number of you know high end audio brands. Uh, we talked about a few. Uh, you have you know a range of Harman brands like like Arcam, JBL Synthesis, and so on. Get Storm Audio, mm -hmm. see that digital uh, data set, and so on and so forth. We talked about okay. NAD and so on. So yeah, we we license to a number of these um, different brands, and and yes, there's uh, quite a lot that is already signed up, but it takes a while, you know, for it to come through through the product cycles and out. To the to the users, so we're happy today to that uh, you know Onkyo and and Pioneer and Pioneer Elite and Integra announced they use Direct Live, and of course that, that is awesome. Yep. That is really good. So we're getting more and more traction, and then we 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 of course and that's with Direct Live. But also, what I want to mention is also we're getting more traction in, for example, headphones like Klipsch just announced 
really nice new uh, TWS headphone, uh, small earbuds, uh, the uh, T52 A and C that has what we call Direct HD sound. It's really based on oh, the wow. Direct Live technology, where we instead of measuring speaker responses in room, we measure the headphone response inside the ear. But this is not wow. for your personal ear. It's it's done for everybody, so we measure on dummy heads and yeah. really optimize the response. Because when you design a headphone, unlike a speaker, it's really tricky to get a really good, even frequency and impulse response, given the size of the transducer. Yeah. So we're very excited about that as well and getting licensing deals with, with uh, headphone makers as well. More very and more. cool. Yeah, That's I'm awesome. assuming putting the microphone inside your ear canal might be a little challenging <laughs> for some people <laughs> to run the... Uh, exactly. like a coat. Like a COVID test, you know? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Gotta have a big ear kind of yeah. yeah. Well, that's, well, that's cool, fantastic. Man. So I just awesome. looked up uh, the DDRC24. And so that looks like it's $450 US. So I'll have to dig into that. I might pick one of those up and play around with it. Um, yeah, sure. It looks like that's uh, probably the easiest and and less ex least expensive way to get into it looks like dude just get well like we were saying throw it on your laptop use it on well, your laptop yeah 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 i'm gonna I, do I mean, that too um so don't tell I mean, me what to do ron i'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> just kidding now yeah it's probably easier to download the software instead of ordering it. Yeah, yeah um and again remind me so if any of the guys and gals want to try that you said that it is it a trial there's a trial yeah, that they can there's do a for? trial version for uh, I think it's 14 days unless we've changed it recently. Okay. Uh, so that's plenty of time. You know, you need to get the microphone. Go to our website, direct.com, and you'll find links to Direct Live. And I'll link everything down below. I'll link it all down below. Cool. Yeah. So there you can try it and get Very a feel cool. for it. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Well, man, Randy, what else do you got, man? Uh, I don't have anything. I mean, this stuff fascinates me. It really does. And I've always, you know, I've, while I, my channel doesn't really concentrate on home theater, I've been a home theater guy for you know 20 plus years. Um, two channel is, is really my, my passion and my love. So I've always been interested and I had actually a little monolith uh, headphone amp. I think it was a DAC, a yeah, monolith DAC headphone amp and it had DRAC in it and it was very rudimentary and it was really just EQ, hmm. but I always in the back of my brain, I was like, man, I, I wish I could have something with Dirac in it because I wanted to see what, what it would do because I, I'm not really in a position to be messing around with a lot of room treatments and things like that. And when Ron mentioned it to me, the light bulb went on. I'm like, man, I, you know, if I had Dirac or something and some of the NAD stuff is a little bit outside, you know, my budget, but also the budget of most of my viewers. So I was always kind of thinking about, you know, how could I implement this into my system? um for less money and yeah so i i don't know this this stuff fascinates me and i think there's so much that can be done in the digital domain but i know there are so many purists that once they find that magic dac that unicorn that they want to maintain that sound and so it's mm. it's having it upstream of your actual dac is Makes sense. i think is really really exciting definitely yeah, that's cool and i mean i think room correction has become sort of a norm for home theater systems but a little bit like you say for the purists two channel guys it's still not you know as common as in in the home theater space which i think is a mistake because there's just as much gain from it from room correction with stereo systems but then you have this worry of course like you said like okay but i like that little thing with my DAC there or maybe i'm using a tube amp but but actually these things if you, you know, if you do this upstream, and also when it comes to the tube amps and the sort of the the harmonics you might want to add there, that's going to go. That's going to be unaffected by room correction because those are what we call nonlinear effects that are really on top of this these room effects. So in that sense, they're very very compatible, and and they make a lot of sense uh, when when you're really a you know audiophile, two channel audiophile like the classical one, and where we're trying to to get people to really appreciate that. And the best way, of course, is just to try it out and see for yourself or, or listen, because hearing is believing in the end. And, right. uh, 
you know that's true that's uh some missionary work we're we're trying to to do <laughs> well dude yeah. i i i've been a big fan and i'm a purist you know and it's like i i was a little bit concerned you know as soon as i i got into like room correction from the get-go um thinking oh this is this is gonna sound weird or it's gonna sound strange and i and i do have to mention that in the early days when i started using it many years ago it did not sound very good sure. and the first time that I heard Dirac and I, and I, and I was using it and I was seeing it and I saw the impulse, I was like, these guys seem to be doing something different. And yep. I do speaker measurements on my channel and I'm, I'm familiar with impulse information, time domain information. And when I started listening and just sitting back and going, this sounds really good. Like that's the starting point of where I started to get excited is, well, now let's, start seeing what we can do with it and i got excited when i started using it with the nadm 33 and the old nadm 10 and yep. even trying to trick it i couldn't trick it like i was trying to set up subs in weird places and try to trick us yeah i'm and i'm like they're they're way they are way smarter than i am and i can't trick them and uh i was i was floored man i was really impressed at how easy it was to get great response out of two subs mm. moving in in different locations exactly. and, and even following up like when i saw your target curve like where you know i was like no way these guys are full of it that's not true i went back and i measured and i'm like it's exactly yep. it's exactly what they say it is and even more I move the microphone over to the left and over to the right to see, is there only one sweet spot? Is it going to fall apart as soon as I move the microphone? And yeah. it didn't. It actually was just a oh. nice, it was it was a great response. I was like, wow. So. I'm happy to hear that. I mean, you, you're getting I'm to. I'm a big fan. It, it's an important point where you said like, you know, 20 years ago, the early days of room correction, for a while there, there was a number of room correction solutions that promised a lot more than they actually delivered. Because, you yeah. know, those days, you know, I guess it was still a bit immature how to do the room correction. And and we have just worked really hard on on getting it right. Like to do to do the right amount of correction, not yeah. overdoing it, getting the right resolution, and just, you know, being careful, conservative in what we do, so that we always like, you know, to do it as good as possible, but not doing anything like that, you know, makes it worse. Because that's what the early sound systems would do. They would take one measurement and they would just trust that 100% and do a high resolution inversion of that measurement. And that's not going to work because if you move your microphone, and by the way, I have two ears, so I'm, I'm not going to listen in one single position, you know, it's going to look different and then you messed it up. So you need to like do this proper measurement of the, of the actual listening area, not just one listening spot, little, you know, spot in, in, in space. And then do the right amount of of correction on that, and then you're getting a great result. But you know, it's fundamental. I'd say room correction is no different from any other processing. And the speaker is a processor, the amplifier is a processor, and all of these things. The whole point is to have the most transparent, the best sound experience at your ears, not at the speaker output, but at your ears. Yeah. And that's like the integration of all these things. And that's where the room correction comes in because it measures the whole chain and looks at like, okay, tries to match everything and make it sound as good as possible. And, and I think it's, uh, it's a very sort of, it should be a fundamental part of any sound system, really. Um, yeah. I think, I think it provides a lot of value. Of course, I'm a bit biased, but you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> but it's because I believe in it and, and I've yeah. worked with it for so long. So yeah, anyway, well, well, we've enjoyed having you. Um, we appreciate your time. And um, I would encourage everybody listening, you know, I'll leave links down below and this will be on both our channels over at Randy's as well. And um, I would encourage you just to try it. You know, I mean, if you get a 14 day free trial, you know, grab yourself a little measurement microphone. They're not too expensive and give it a go and see what you think. Because, um, you know, if, if anybody out there is going to be hard to impress when it comes to stuff, it would be me. I'm a two-channel purist, and I've been so impressed with how 
not only just you know direct sounds that's you know that's where it has to start but the usability of it and how fun it is to set up different curves if i'm listening at night you know it's like you can just save different curves and then change the curves in an instant and start listening it it's a blast so um thank you uh for your time we appreciate it man Thanks a lot. It was really great to, to talk with you guys about room correction and so on. And, you know, we love getting feedback. So, you know, whenever you guys will listen now, uh, try it out and so on. Just, you know, send us feedback on what you like and what you don't, because we were cool. constantly trying to make direct live better. We're sure. And that, yeah, that's something we didn't talk about, but, you know, cool. we're, we're constantly working on that. And it's going to cool. be new, exciting stuff step by step every year. Awesome. Fair Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a good yeah. night, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.